Far east of the Sword Coast, the Shadowvar and Discoverin have fallen. The Shadow Storm is no more. Sembia is fractured into city-states. A mysterious hero rises from the ashes to usher in a new era of prosperity. Yet there is still suffering. Cormir and the wild elves of the Dale Lands offer war on all sides. Earth motes, madness, and shadow dragons plague the lands. These are the tales of the heroes who ended that suffering. 1491 DR, the year of Sembian revival. All right, welcome, friends, to season four of The Long-Winded One. It's been probably three or four months since I've done an interview, and I got to tell you guys, I'm excited to be back doing this. Obviously, we've shifted gears from Arda. Um, we are now in the world of Forgotten Realms. Tonight, I'm I'm back to interviewing, which, as you know, this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and my guest tonight is an author and an editor, and he has had his hands and, and influenced some of the worlds that are, are really special to me, and I'm sure they're special to you. When I say his name, you're going to know. Um, he's written his own books. He writes short stories. He has worked for TSR. He's, he's been an editor for Wizards of the Coast. Um, he's written for Warhammer. Um, he's written his own fiction and how-to books on how to write fiction and sci-fi. And he now runs his own company called Athens Associates. Help me to welcome Philip Athens to the podcast. Well, hello. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know that we are we are talking about Forgotten Realms. We're talking about Sembia. And one of the reasons I asked you to be to come and be sort of the first guest to kick off a season four um, was because you were the managing editor at Wizards um, when the uh, sort of whole Gateway to Symbia series came out and when Erebus Kale was published. Is that right? I was. Yeah. Yeah. That was all me. <laughs> I was the Forgotten Realms line editor, too, at that time. And for most of the time um, that I was with uh, Wizards of the Coast, TSR before that. I'm sure. You. Sure. So um, did you did you want to elaborate on that at, at all or, or give a little introduction, something that I missed? Um, talk um, about your time at TSR or Wizards? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I was just all kind of, you know, a role playing gamer and, and discovered D&D pretty early on in its history. That would be like the uh, summer of 1978. Um, right before I started high school. Um, and, you know, by the time high school started, that really became what I did. Like I had now, I had fully adopted the RPG lifestyle, um, really, you know, in those sort of first days. Um, and, you know, so it just, it, it was sort of the thing that got me through. Um, it was the thing that created a, a group of friends for myself. And, um, and just, you know, I think as, as long as I can remember, I always just wanted to write. I wanted to make movies i just kind of had this storyteller gene somehow um and of course dnd just immediately just you know hit right on that and said this is we can get together as a group and tell uh stories fantasy stories and then i started playing traveler because i was like what well, we can do science fiction in this this is amazing <laughs> like, this is like the greatest thing of all and i really do think it's it's one of you know the 20th century's great inventions you know the role-playing game is really um i think more important and far reaching than, than a lot of people really understand. I, I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think, you know, for me as, as a kid, um, it really helped develop my imagination and, and gave me that love to create as you were just talking about. Yeah. And, you know, so it, you know, it, and so I just started writing and, and, you know, especially after I, you know, graduated from college, I started thinking, you know, I, I, I really need to start getting writing out there and figuring out how to do this professionally. And then, um, you know, thought I love role-playing games. Um, somebody is writing these things, you know, why not me? So I started, I, I went to Gen Con one year in particular, and just with the idea that I'm just going to go out there and meet people people and try to get myself into the RPG industry, right? Um, and so started doing a bunch of freelance stuff for, you know, some publishers that, you know, you probably wouldn't even remember now. Um, one actually went out of business while I was working on a, a pretty major you know, book for them um, and essentially ghosted me like they just disappeared. <laughs> and, and, you know, there were others that were actually, you know, pretty good players at the time like GDW and um, Digest 
group publications that did um, really the best traveler stuff around the mega traveler era. And so I started getting into that and had sent a proposal for um, a D and D campaign setting because you know what, if you're going to pitch, pitch huge <laughs> to TSR. And you know, I got a call back saying, "Why don't you come? We want you to come in for an interview," which I thought was weird. Why are you interviewing me for a freelance thing? <laughs> But I was like, sure, I'll come in for an interview. And it ended up being an interview for a, a job that had come open as an editor in the book publishing team at TSR. And I thought I blew the interview totally. It's one of those where I left going like, oh, God, that would have been the greatest job. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. I was managing a record store in suburban Chicago at the time and was really burned out of that. Um, and, you know, I was just so disappointed that like that would have been just the greatest thing. I mean, I, I'm a real like D&D fan. Yeah. And, you know, to make that drive up to Lake Geneva and go into that weird building and just be like, I could be a part of this. Like, oh, well, too bad. But, you know, and again, I was sure I blew it, but then I got the call back. Um, like, when can you start? I was wow. like, I mean, if I could have teleported there, I, I would have been standing behind him like, here, what do you need me to do? <laughs> I'm like, I'm here. Um, and so I just started, I, you know, it was a nice long commute, you know, um, 54 miles each way. But I was, you know, determined to, to do it. So I, you know, I got there and just started this trial by fire um, education as a as a tie-in fiction editor. <laughs> and, you know, I had, had had some experience on the freelancing basis and then I, you know, had had published my own magazine before that, and so I didn't come in completely cold. But um, it, it was a very different way of doing things, high in fiction at that level and at that time, which was really, really super popular because you're talking about 1995 when I started. So still really more or less pre-internet, you know, where the internet really wasn't the force that would pretty quickly become. Um, and so, you know, those books were selling really well. There was a real big fan base. Um, um, and there was just a lot to a lot to absorb. But by the time the I, I was only there for less than two years before Wizards of the Coast bought the company um, and moved us all um, a couple thousand miles west to Seattle. Um, and that was when I became the Forgotten Realms line editor. Before that, we didn't have line editors. Everybody was just sort of assigned things at random. Um, and so, well, know. it sounds like that's a smart way to do it, actually, right? To have kind of this, you know, uh, content expert almost, you know, assigned. To, the, to a line. Right, which is, you know, I, the, the first really good decision that my, my new boss uh, <laughs> really, really made, which was to, to do exactly exactly that, right? To have, you know, one sort of, um, you know, content owner essentially for, for each of those lines, at least the big lines. Um, and then I would kind of dip in and, you know, help to launch stuff like the Greyhawk novels that, you know, kind of were cool and, but also kind of didn't work. And, you know, we, you know, attempts to relaunch Ravenloft and things like that and some other new stuff, um, newer properties from, uh, you know, Wizards of the Coast. But it was mostly, you know, 15 years of living in the realms all time. Ah, oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> it was. I mean, it really was. Well, can, can I ask a little bit about, um, so we're, we're going to talk more about um, sort of your role at Wizards, I think, in a little bit. But let's you, you've answered a little bit of my question about your own uh, role playing experience. But like, I, I want to know more like does does being kind of this uh, Forgotten Realms guy at Wizards does does that influence your own sort of role playing experience and 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 if you could talk more about that and like what is your favorite campaign setting like is it Forgotten Realms you know what it, it's it's terrible to say that it it's not really you know what I mean? that, yeah um, I did you know run a fourth edition um, FR campaign game you know for a long time for months at uh, at Wizards with the whole uh, um, book publishing team all the editors and the art director that worked for me and you know we had a lot of fun with it you know sort of learning it and the idea it was an exercise to learn fourth edition for all of us mm -hmm. um and to start to work through and just sort of see in a in a real way how does this feel as a um as a player mm -hmm. because you know i was part of this you know three person team that was responsible for trying to figure out how to force the forgotten realms world into the fourth edition uh rule set which was essentially impossible 
have to do, right? And we, you know, it was Rich Baker and Bruce Cordell and myself, and and we just did the absolute best we could and then wanted to see, well, how does this actually play, at least? You know, it may, it may render, uh, you know, a huge backlist of novels almost obsolete in some way, um, which was not good. But, um, you know, I think it I think it stands as a, a, a sort of version of The Forgotten, right? And I don't know if you've ever played fourth edition D and D. Oh, I did. Yeah. It was, yeah. uh, it was pr- actually, it was a lot of fun to like, to figure out all of those, you know, there, there were mm-hmm. definitely like certain builds that you could make that were like, okay, let's see if I can do this with this build. Right. <laughs> right. Um, like, yeah. H- how can I make this feel like D and D? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. I, yeah. I will still say though, that it is the best, uh, skirmish level miniatures combat game ever, ever. So if you're just sort of, we just want to do a big monster fight um it is absolutely brilliantly designed. as a role-playing game it's definitely less than stuff well th- what i've noticed is i mean i j- just like anything right rpgs seem to be influenced by what's going on in the world right mm-hmm. and, and and video games and, and all that sort of thing so like it, it it's clear to me sort of um from a ten thousand foot view th- like how fourth edition was influenced and then and then like as a result of fourth edition, fifth edition came about, <laughs> right? Like, right. Yeah. So, so, so like I, I can, I can kind of see the evolution of the game in, mm-hmm. in that sense. But yeah, and there was some, you know, there was some, you know, kind of big meta level events that happened around fourth edition too. That you know, what no one knew was that it was going to be released right into the teeth of a depression. You know, that the it literally came out and then the economy closed. And so you were, we were essentially saying, hey, everybody, here's a, you know, big hundred and twenty dollar buy in for a new D and D, and you're either unemployed or about to be unemployed. So no, oh no, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people had really, you know, gotten invested in third edition, and it was so robustly, you know, designed that saying you have to completely stop and start all over again and spend a whole bunch more money, and then not use any of the stuff that you already spent um, while the economy is collapsing. It just kind of worked against. It, man you know, well yeah I, I feel I, I feel like some people completely skipped over fourth edition and uh, you know like they mm-hmm. were I, I think it probably just has to do with also my generation right like you know grew up playing third edition and then you know you you kind of whatever you went to school and then and then you come back to it and it's like oh what's this fifth edition let me mm-hmm. check it out no and you know here's the thing I, the, the greatest era of music is when you were 17. Right. And, you know, like <laughs> the the absolute, definitely the best edition of D&D is the one you first started playing. Um, so I have a feeling there's these groups of fourth edition players who are out there going like, what? This was, this is like what D&D is um, because it was the first one they tried. Um, that's probably a pretty small group, but, you know, um, <laughs> third edition really, you know, brought so many new people into the game um, that, you know, I can see why, you know, for, for people who are younger than me anyway, that that would be the default setting and i know a lot of fifth edition was sort of bringing it back to that maybe simplifying it a little yeah simplifying and making more flexible Mm -hmm. um so can I, well, can I ask you, so I want to, I want to drill in a little bit more, um, you, you know, whether Forgotten Realms is your favorite campaign setting or not, like, did you talk, can you talk to us a little bit about Symbia? Like, did, did you know Symbia mm-hmm. very well? Uh, no, and there, and, and there was a reason for that actually. So in the original conception it, and Forgotten Realms has gone through so many changes and iterations and it was so robustly and in some cases even over designed that you know, there was sort of a feeling of the original intent. And if Mm -hmm. you would talk to Ed Greenwood, he would say, well, the original intent of this was, you know, and and then it would change like 15 or 20,000 times after that. But I think the original intent for Sambia was, we're just going to name it, but here's a place on the map and we're going to put a couple of dots and and name the cities. And then you, the DM, go and design that for yourself. You say... Playgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it's going to be different for everybody. And I think that's a great idea. But as the realms became, you know, so filled in and you were getting things like the the Corman Fear box set, which was just a, 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 as robust a history of anything as you'll ever be able to find. I'm not sure that you could find that much information about ancient Egypt if you tried. <laughs> it, was, it was just book after book of like six point type of, of the entire history of, of that, you know, elf empire. Um, once you start really, really designing all around it, like we know absolutely 
everything there is to know about Cormier. We know absolutely everything there is to know about Anorak, etc. That it's hard for that not to bleed in. So some things about Sembia had to be written down. And then at some point it was just, you know, I, like I think it's in the FR Adventures hardcover. This was still first edition. Um, they would, you know, have sections on cities and they were like, well, let's just make up some stuff about Selgon. And once you do that, now we have officially published stuff about Sembia. So there was a little bit, but not a lot. Right. And so that actually made it the right place for what we were hoping to gain from the series on a kind of, you know, a marketing or brand positioning level. Yikes. Uh, I'm so yeah. glad I don't have to use terms like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet you do, though. <laughs> yeah, I, try, I try so hard not to. I slap myself in the face when I say the word branding. But, um, you know, because there was a little bit of information, but it wasn't, okay, now you have to absorb, you know, the sort of 15 volume rise and fall of the Roman Empire kind of thing. Um, and, you know, so it would be not only easier for the authors to sort of, you know, tell stories in that in that spot on the map, but it would be easier for new readers to come in with them without again also having to try to you know absorb all that detail yeah you know yeah well of. i mean yeah i mean I, for me that's the that's the most interesting thing to try to to write right as to like this historic fiction almost right where there's there there are these you know dots as you said like oh we know a little bit about but let's weave the story and you know there's not much right. there so can, can we transition into can i ask you about this this um you, you mentioned the book series so the the gateway to symbian novels um which which you know starts with this book called the the halls of storm weather and mm -hmm. when i you know it, i'm re i'm re-listening to it now um, i went through the whole series and the first time listening to it on I, I was you know i have a long commute so i listened to a lot of the books on on audiobook and um and i'm and i'm listening to it and i'm thinking what is going on here like, i'm i'm just now getting to know some of the characters and they switch to this other story and it, of course eventually like oh i figured out like okay what's going on here mm -hmm. Um, and and for, for the listener here, um, what's going on here is they're giving you a snapshot of the next you know, like six novels, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and so can you walk us through like okay, how did this how did this pitch uh, come about the the whole gateway to Symbian novels and like you know can, can you just talk to us about like how the authors were selected in, in in that whole process? Sure. So the original idea came from the sort of reality that and again these were you know totally different times with a whole different different sort of re book retail landscape and, you know, all that kind of stuff that we still had over a hundred Forgotten Realms titles and active backlist so that they were still orderable and stocked in bookstores all over the place. And this was um, what, like 1999, 2000 yeah, something? Yeah, right in that 1999, 2000 timeframe um, or really 98. 98. And there were, it, there might've been 200 by the time that that series had, had stopped I, or, you know, came to an end. It was just um, at one point we were publishing, I think there was one year, I want to say it was maybe 2001, 2002, that we published 17 new Forgotten Realms books in one year. Um, so they were just more than one a month. And there was just a, tons and tons of, of uh, content going all the way back to the first one, I, um, which was the Douglas Niles um, Dark Walker on Moonshade stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been like 87, 88 in that territory. The first Dritz book was 88. Um, so it was just years already, 10 years of, of 10, 12 books a year. And it was just a lot, you know, you would go into a, you know, Barnes and Noble or something and there would be just shelf after shelf after shelf with that logo on it. And it was really, it, you know, we sort of putting ourselves in the, in the shoes of somebody who's like, you know, even a D and D player or just a fantasy fan. And they're looking at these and they look cool. You know, we really worked hard on getting good cover art and stuff, you know, yeah. It, and, and clearly there's a lot out there. So people must be reading them. Where do you begin? Um, and it had really gotten to the, you know, things like the Harper series, you know, were supposed to be standalones, but then sequels were written to some of them. So that, you know, like three or four of them were by Elaine Cunningham and they were direct sequels. Troy Danning wrote two, one and a yep. sequel. Yep. And they were all numbered, but they weren't in any kind of order with those, you know, with the sort of internal series. And it was all just super confusing. <laughs> so, you 
you know, we started talking about that and and said sort of, you know, if we were going to make a Forgotten Realms TV series and, you know, what would that actually be and how would that represent not just, you know, a very specific part of the realms, but how would you present the Forgotten Realms to somebody who knows nothing about it and is not going to sit down and read the, you know, campaign setting box set, mm-hmm. um, you know, who's just sort of a fantasy fan reader. And there was kind of no answer to that. Pretty much most people were just sort of like, you haven't read the Dritz books? What are you, crazy? <laughs> no, they were coming through that, clearly, right? But, you know, beyond that, there's kind of how do you, you know, provide an entry point for readers? And that's what the series was meant to be. And so the original, it was originally published with just, the, the series title was just Sembia. That was sort of my mistake. And that sort of the marketing end of that, of, you know, kind of communicating to people, hey, this is where you start. Um, we're going to kind of spoon feed the world to you a little bit. And, you know, from there, then you can just go off and, and hopefully read all of them. Um, and so it was eventually relaunched as uh, Sembia Gateway to the Realm, so that we sort of tried to bring that idea a little bit more out into, into the open. Um, so that was really the idea behind that. Um, and we really started talking about that in earnest right toward the end of 98. Um, so pretty soon after coming into, you know, coming out to Seattle Blizzard. So, you know, in that kind of thing, you know, one of the rules that I would t- I would sort of talk to authors and say, if you're going to mention some in-world thing, right, don't just say Waterdeep, which every other author would do, assuming you know what Waterdeep is, right? Say the city of Waterdeep. And, you know, just one uh-huh. or two words that will help people understand what that is. And so, you know, and in the edits, we tried to be, you know, I tried to be, um, you know, cognizant of that as I went along. The degree to which I succeeded in that, I don't know, you know, because by then I had already been living in it long enough that, you know, well, I know what they're talking about. (laughs) So you have to try to turn that off a little bit or mute that and say, you know, so what if I know? I have to sell this to, you know, 50,000 strangers. So what about these authors? Like how um, did you hand select them? Or did they, Mm -hmm. you know, did they apply? Like how how did that work? Well, yes and no. So we went to most of the authors. And the, and so um, I actually dug up. I actually have a hard copy still, my hard copy of the Sembia Author Editor's Guide, which is a, the story bible for the series. Mm. And the original seven authors were, first we started with Ed Greenwood, because I thought, you know, let's tap Ed to do some fleshing out of the city of Selgon and more about Sembia, Sembian culture, so that we could give authors a little bit more, you know, and also to make sure that everybody was working from the same a uh, set of rules in the same specific setting mm-hmm. and they weren't just you know blindly kind of making stuff up that was interfering with other stories and so on and so he was for sure like let's lead, you know have a lead in right and he he's the first story in the in the anthology and took on the character of the of the patriarch of the family sure um and from no. there there were just authors that we had worked with on a, on on one level or another who had written short stories or other things for us um like Richard Lee Byer um, and Lisa Smedman, who is just, you know, super great. Dave Gross um, was actually editor of Dungeon Ma- or uh, Dragon Magazine at the time. That's right. So he yeah. was a TSR, you know, veteran who was really, you know, had had written some short stories as well and was kind of, you know, eager to get into that, that end of the business. And Clayton Emery had written um, a book for us so fast, he's got the land speed record. He wrote the first uh, Netherold book from way back. Um, way back in the day in like this, like two weeks it was insane because oh another gosh. author had just sort of flaked and didn't didn't finish it and in those days now once I kind of had you know a little bit more control of the scheduling reins and stuff we would have just canceled that and you know <laughs> moved it or rethought um, but back in those days if it was on the schedule it was going to come out damn it you know yeah, and it yeah, was like yeah. find somebody who can just write this um, as fast as possible so you know he was just somebody that I knew I could rely on to just uh, do the impossible and do his homework and really, you know, deliver something really, really great. Well, Clayton actually lives not too far from me. He's um, he's agreed to to come on the podcast and oh, I would, uh, yeah, I'll be interested to hear that one because you know because he sort of dropped out. He dropped out between the anthology and writing his his book, um, and I'm still honestly a little bit puzzled by what happened there. Um, but then all the and. and and then we also had another author who worked at Wizards at the time, who everybody, you know, 
really admired the stuff that she was working on, Kids Johnson, who went on to publish, you know, non-tie-in stuff. And has got this great career, actually. Um, and she wrote an outline for uh, the Tazzy story mm -hmm. that's, in the, that's in the Bible. And then I don't, and again, it's now been 20 years plus. So I don't remember exactly the circumstances where I think it around that time was when she left the company. And so she dropped out and didn't write the story in the anthology. And, so, um, so she wrote the, she wrote the outline for Sands of the Soul? Um, yeah. Well, for that first short story. And then, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. And then um, I honestly don't know how we found Veronica Whitney Robinson, but she was terrific and just really <laughs> slotted right in and really did a great job. So there was some, you know, and this was always happening, you know, sort of behind the scenes. People were, you know, coming in and out and, um, you know, deadlines were stretching and, and, you know, things were going wrong and things were going right and so on. So, um, but once we had that, or, you know, I had that, that set of seven authors, it, it went pretty well. The, I was really happy with the way the anthology turned out. But that was the idea was that here's this, you know, in prominent family in one city in Sambia, and each of the seven authors were assigned to one member of the family and then wrote a short story for Halls of Stormweather that would introduce that character. Mm -hmm. And then the idea from there is that they would each go out and write one book, you know, um, based on that character that would, you know, follow that character, you know, out of the city and, and into their own thing. Well, how, how much freedom did these authors have to sort of create in the world? Um, some of them have really a lot. And again, that's why, you know, Sembia really worked for us. It was, we know this much about the city Ed, you know, provided more um, details again, so that there was a sense of consistency. It wasn't just, you know, wildly uh, everybody just kind of going off on tangents and then trying to figure out how to make this make sense. Um, but they really had a lot of, I think the only author who really had the most homework to do was Richard Lee Byer, um, because his character actually had this whole backstory that was in um, one of the game products that sort of told about her just kind of being frozen for a long period of time and the sword that she had and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody else, you know, I, there was only just her and I think that they, I don't know that we had in that in that game product names of any of the kids or anybody else. So we knew the two, the, the mother and father of the family. And then, you know, I just said, all right, well then who else is in here? You know, let's give them a daughter, you know, sort of the number one son the, or the heir. And this actually is in the Bible that was the original like sort of placeholder titles for everybody the patriarch the matriarch the heir you know, and they had so they had a uh, and then i thought a second son would be cool right that's always interesting you're the guy who's not going to be the next patriarch of the family so where does that leave you and just yeah and then and then just on a whim i said oh and he's a werewolf it literally just that much thought you know like give so this is what i gave to the the authors originally just um that much right they should have a butler because that would be cool right that sort of family would have this guy. And so it was, he's the butler, but there's, he's got big secrets, right? He's not just a butler. Oh, yeah, there's he something, does. Yeah, there's something more to this guy. But that was it. <laughs> and um, there's a maid also, because there should be this weird little chambermaid. Um, but she's actually the illegitimate daughter of... Um, Emily. Yeah. Yep. And that was it. I really gave them that much and said, okay, go. And then every once in a while, it would Wizards, we would do these open calls for, you know, new authors. We did the one that ended up being Eberron, right? That was a huge one, big search for a new D&D um, &D campaign setting. And, you know, I said, I want to go out into the world and see if I can find a completely new author um, and for the, and let's say the butler. So I wrote up, you know, um, sort of guidelines and, and posted them on the website. This is what we're doing, you know, send me your pitches and sort of narrowed those down to a few and said, them out to some other um, people who work at Wizards and, and you know, my boss and my boss's boss kind of went, read through them and um, narrowed down and we sort of sat and voted and I thought, I like this guy, um, this Erebus Kale guy. There's something, I think he's onto something there. There's something really cool there. And 
and so that was Paul Kemp. And so I called him and said, all right, you're in. You want to do this? Like, <laughs> you're like you're going to really, are you going to be able to commit to this? And he was all in. I mean, he went all just committed to it and um, did a fantastic job with the story. And then obviously took that character and ran with it. Well, he's so, he's obviously one of my favorite characters. And my our, our story uh, and the podcast sort of follows, you know, after his two trilogies in The Godborn, mm -hmm. um, you know, about six years after the last novel got the Godborn, our story picks up kind of in the five E, you know, timeline. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and and he he's definitely my favorite character. But I, I have a question real quick before we go back to uh, uh Paul Kemp. Mm -hmm. You talked you, you've used this word Bible um several times already. Mm -hmm. Um you used it also in your uh two thousand nine Wizards interview. Uh, what is that exactly? So actually I'm I'm holding it in my hand. You might be able to hear it crunching because it's got this yeah. bone bound thing, you know, that we put together um in house and you know there's another one for the war of the spider queen series which is much thicker um you know way more robust but basically it says this is what this series is um and i can actually read the very sort of very short little it, this this one is version two so dated may 3rd 1999 and the little introduction says sembia is a series of novels set in the forgotten realms world that follows seven members of a wealthy merchant family in the sembian city of selgon like the rest of the Forgotten Realms line, Sumbia stresses action adventure elements, what we like to call guys fighting monsters with magic. And so I did, sort of broke that down into what I meant by guys, what I meant by fighting, what I meant by monsters and yeah. so on. And, you know, basically he said, don't make this into some sort of you know, PG Wodehouse thing or or you know, I would have used uh, Downton Abbey as an example if that <laughs> existed in 1999. Like, don't do that. This is still needs to be a and d book. Um, and then we just went into the, who this family is where they live um you know all the you know background sort of recent family background and and a bunch of stuff about um the city of selgon um some of the other big families there that would be sort of rivals to you know rivals or friend the talendars yeah right and yeah. it just kind of went on for a few pages and then got into the characters which were at, on, in version one was here's the patriarch we know his name Thamelon. and um ed had again because we said okay now you know ed go and help us with this right help us um flesh this out he had done a lot you know he for himself you know for ed usually when i would ask ed a question you know very simple kind of realms lore question i would shoot him an email and the email response that he would send back would just be page after page after page of exhaustive detail <laughs> of course so it he, would. <laughs> he did. the 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 mind of ed greenwood is the most expansive of any human on earth i think he he just has this kind of natural aversion to an unanswered question or a partially answered question or a succinctly <laughs> answered question. And he just thought this is an opening for me to just riff on stuff. And so it was, you've asked me for detail. Here comes the detail. Right? <laughs> Get ready. So we yeah. sort of, you know, kind of tried to leave that open and say, hey, make sure that all these other six authors have places to roam. And, you know, he was and it, as, as expansive as his mind is, he's also incredibly generous that way. Um, and, you know, I was always excited to see what other people were doing and what other people would bring to that, bring to the world and so on. Well, um, let's go. Um, I have another sort of uh, question about, I guess it's a process question. I'm not, I'm not sure. Like we just asked you about the, this, this term Bible. I, you, you referred in one of your interviews uh, previous, you, you referred to um, the Twilight War novels, which is one of the Erebus Kale trilogies. Um, uh, we, we, it was called a transition series. And, and I was wondering what, what you meant by that. Is it, is it just like a, is a transition from like one area of the world um, of Faerun to another, or is it from one edition to another? Could you talk that, about that? Yeah, that was from one edition to another. Um, there, that actually started before me. I maybe was the person who sort of attached that name to it, but um, you know, there was that series of, of books that transitioned the realms from first edition to second edition, mm -hmm. um, which was that weird sort of, um, you know, we're running scared of some kind of, um, you know, sort of fundamentalist Christian backlash or whatever was happening. Yeah, I remember that. And so all of the assassins die all of a sudden, um, ah. which was just kind of weird. And a lot of gods um, changed and you can't call them demons anymore and that kind of stuff. Um, there were some that, you know, third edition did make, made the third edition FR campaign setting made 
some pretty, not radical, right, but some substantial changes to the world. And so rather than just say, oh, it's kind of always been that way, um, I, I saw that as an opportunity. So um, there were some changes to the elves, like sort of the way the elves work. Um, so I tapped Rich Baker to write that. Uh, last it became the last Mythal trilogy. Um, and so there were, in, in some cases, you know, holes that had to be filled in, um, in in that transition from second to third edition. And then, of course, there were a whole bunch of them that, you know, were sort of that almost last run of, of Forgotten Realms books that were transitioning between third and fourth edition, which was a much bigger transition. Um, and then, of course, after I left, there was more, another series <laughs> that transitioned from fourth to fifth. So there was just sort of, those were the things that told the story of why all of a sudden magic were different. Well, you know, it's funny to hear you talk about that because I, I, I seem to remember terms changing um, over the course of those six Erebus Kale novels, or I guess mm-hmm. seven Erebus Kale novels. Like, you know, the Plane of Shadow um, was uh, eventually called the Shadow Fell, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was that one that kind of changed during that whole transition? It was. There was, you know, so in third edition, there was, it was still the Plane of Shadow. And um, the magic system changed really radically for fourth edition, where the whole sort of multiverse was completely trashed and replaced with something else. And in order to make that make sense as, you know, so that we, and it, we're not going to throw away literally 200 novels that, you know, some of which were still selling like crazy, right? We're going to just, oh, the whole drip series didn't happen. Yeah. That's crazy. So that's, you know, nobody's going to do that. So we had to figure some mechanism that said um, it has been like this all the time. And then this disaster happens and it becomes fourth edition. And where things got muddy in there, just sort of where release schedules all of a sudden spread out in ways that, you know, made that transition clunky. Um, It really felt right away to a lot of Realms fans in particular that we had turned the Forgotten Realms into Disaster World, that it was now just this, you're living in this disaster, when really the idea was this disaster happened. Now you're stopping everything and you're restarting again 80 some years later, and this is the new normal. So if you look at the fourth edition Forgotten Realms campaign setting, it's not like, and this terrible disaster is happening. Um, It's, this is what the realms looks like. Yeah, And it's just normal, but magic works in a completely different way. Um, the universe is completely different. Gods are completely different. Um, and it was kind of the only way we could think to do it that, that made sense. Uh, because the option of, well, we'll just leave this as sort of a third edition world was not a was not an option that we were given. And, I, you know, again, I think that, you know, I, there's a lot of the fourth edition Forgotten Realms campaign setting that I really stand behind. And I think we're, we're actually improvements in terms of, you you know, playability of the massive quantities of realms lore. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, I think it wasn't really anyone's first choice to do that. It was to sort of, we had kind of had no choice. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, I, I want to ask you about something else now. So like, mm-hmm. it's, we have this opportunity to, to speak with you who were, you know, you were there, you were in the midst of all of this, you were in charge of most of it. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us like a, like a little uh, story or an anecdote or, or some, some more of sort of the behind the scenes information about like Shadowvar, the Mythalers, the mm-hmm. New Skevrin, the Talendars. So, so they, they're all sort of part and parcel to not just the, you know, Gateway to the Realm series, but but also to our podcast. So anything you can tell us would be super interesting. Sure. So the Shadowvar in particular really have this, you know, I feel I've, I've always felt really close to. I mean, they were kind of not really my creation, but I sort of started that ball rolling and gave it to Troy Denning, who just like crushed it in uh, Return of the Archwizards. And the idea there was, and this was started really before um, third edition and, or just before third edition, that back at TSR, and it was part of, part of it was this sort of satanic panic thing that was happening that was before I started there. Um, they imposed the code of ethics or the TSR code of ethics, which was just the old comics code authority, you know, the old comics code, um, like literally just copied on, which is insane. Really, I mean, like looking at it from 2021 backward, it's just goofy and bizarre, right? So it's stuff like evil can never be seen to, to be winning, and you can't 
ever you know ha you you can't um you can't have authority figures behaving badly right the cops are always super good and the bad guys are always super bad and the bad guys always get caught and that kind of stuff um and no one ever touches each other or has sex or is naked like ever you know and just i was all very hyper restrictive which my you know sort of boss or my boss's boss when i first started in 95 had already pretty much ignored that but then would use it to you know against everybody else when he wanted to so it was already starting to you know really fall by the wayside um but once we became part of wizards of the coast um they when they heard we were doing that it was just like what are you doing really why right because you know they were a you know modern company who was doing things like um you know understanding their demographics and stuff like that and we weren't selling books to eight-year-olds um and so we don't have to treat them like eight-year-olds and what a breath of fresh air to literally everybody but that will really tell you why when you get to like 1999, 2000, the realms takes a very decided left turn into the darkness. You know? And so, um, but because of that code of ethics, there was, you know, a lot of those sort of, oh, they're the really scary villain groups, the Gentarum in particular, um, had been made so gutless that it was impossible to really sell them as, oh, they're this big threat. Like they're the mafia. Um, it's like, they're these guys who dress in black and slip on banana peels. It was terrible. Um, um, and I'm you know, like the original Trekkie and Deep Space Nine was on at the time. And I said, you know, what we need is the Cardassians. We need to introduce new bad guys who are actually really cool and aren't, you know, just some sort of Cold War. You know, the Klingons are the Russians and the Romulans are the Chinese kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, I and at that point I was pitching for the realms things that were what I called non-changing changes. Like we're going to change the world, but you're not going to really feel it. It's not going to blow up your game at home, um, but it's going to make dragons more of a threat for the future. And we're going to, and I thought, let's introduce these bad guys and say, okay, now you have some bad guys who aren't just going to slip on banana peels, who aren't, who are sometimes going to win, you know, <laughs> who are going to actually be scary and powerful. Um, and so, you know, I was like one of the three or four fans of the Netheril box. Set. Um, and there was that one city, the city of shade that did disappeared into the plane of shadow right before the fall of Netheril and all these cities, floating cities all crashed to the ground and the empire was destroyed. And I just thought, well, perfect, right? They come back, <laughs> they look around and say, oh my God, the barbarians have taken over and they've turned our empire into a desert. We need to get this um, set right. And they just go about, you know, trying to sort of reestablish this empire. Um, and so those are our new bad guys. And there were even plans at that point to, you know, sort of release a shadow weave or shadow magic book that would introduce shadow magic to um dnd &D in general um that got sidelined and and when we they went we they us <laughs> them went into fourth edition anyway which ended up you know really playing into that so which was nice that the shadow bar ended up you know continuing to be interesting and a force for the in the realms from then on so that was really you know and, and because again because they're located nearby right they came back right at that sort of southern end of of the desert anorak that they were right there in sembia and so you know yeah and for so for fourth edition i said well these it seemed like sembia would be easy pickings for these guys right they can talk the talk they can they can relate to somebody who's willing to take a payoff you know <laughs> like they could just buy their way into annexing sembia and so that was something that, you know, Paul Camp obviously grabbed and ran with like crazy. Um, and yeah, I know the, the, the Shadow of Our and Shade Enclave and the Return Netheril, that was really my, uh, you know, something that I was really excited about. That's amazing. That's great. Well, let, let's talk more about you now. Let's let, let me, um, so you, you're an author, you've written many things, you've written fantasy, mm -hmm. but you've also written these, these books for, for as, aspiring writers, right? Uh -huh. Could, could you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. Um, um, you know, I, I, I went in obviously as a sort of as a writer first and then a, you know, a gamer and, and was able to sort of put those two things together, you know, working as a, as a book editor for, for the king of role playing games. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was always sort of looking to write stuff, but then it was really kind of, you know, my, my personal sensibilities, like I, I, I could turn on the Forgotten Realms line editor um, and then try to figure out how 
does the author fit into that? You know, so um, I just started, but I wanted to get in on that and started to kind of get my feet wet with short stories and then, you know, kind of was deposited into the Spider Queen series and went through the, you know, Baldur's Gate fiasco and then um, uh, wrote my own trilogy that they sort of gave me, you know, I said, I know that I can, I've got this tiny little place that I can just grab onto that there hasn't been anything filled in on. Um, and so I kept it super tight, you know, I just kept it really right in there. Um, and it got, and, and I was just kind of the guy who was kind of pushing it darker at that time too. Um, but then after it was, I was still at Wizards of the Coast when my former boss who had left the company and started working for Adams Media, another publisher, um, came to me with the idea of writing a, you know, basically a how-to book, right, on uh, writing fantasy and science fiction. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, I could do that, right? So I, <laughs> I take some of, take the stuff that I've learned over the years by not just writing, right, which is one thing, but as an editor, you're working with all of this group of authors. And again, before that, right, you know, working in sort of literary magazine universe and, and so on, um, you know, I saw the way people did it well and people fell short um in a you know really wide variety of ways and so um put that out and then you know not too long after i mean i think right exactly around the same time actually um was when stuff started to kind of fall apart post depression post fourth edition you know all that kind of stuff like around yeah. like like post like 2009 2010, 2010. Yeah. yeah um and so layoffs were happening and and one of them happened to me and and, you know, I thought, well, okay, so now what do I do, right? As the sort of guy in his, what, mid 40s, mid to late 40s in, you know, a depression. <laughs> There's really, you know, they call it the Great Recession, but I think that splitting hairs, it felt, certainly felt like a depression to me. And I know it did to a lot of people around the world. Absolutely. But, absolutely. Um, you know, I found that I actually really liked that end of it, right? Teaching, writing. Um, I started teaching at a college here and, and and sort of then ended up sort of transitioning those to online courses through Writer's Digest. Um, wrote another book called Writing Monsters for Writer's Digest book that really, you know, concentrated just on monsters, which I just have this love of monsters. Well, let, let me ask you, let me ask you more about that. So right around 2010, um, you started your own company uh, called Athens Associates. Um, and here we are 11 years later. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your company and, sure. and also kind of what you have going on right now. Like, what are you writing? So um, right now I'm right. I've kind of taken my writing back to well. There's sort of two, right? I write a lot about writing and how to write and what makes you know your what can help you learn the craft of writing, craft of fiction in general, and fantasy, science fiction, and horror in particular. Um, but I'm basically also a freelance editor, essentially. And people can go to AthensAssociates.com and get get a big download on all that stuff. I've been doing a lot of ghost writing, right? which is the number of books that I will never kind of contractually obligated to not talk about. So you know, you'll never, you'll never know um, what I had a hand in and, and what degree to which I actually did have a hand in it. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that, but my own writing, I've really either, you know, it is writing about writing and then the fiction is going back to short stories right now, kind of short stories and poetry and, and kind of easing my way into, can I keep doing what I'm doing? and also tackle another novel. But it's it's definitely not going to be, you know, kind of D&D &D fantasy. You know, I think my own sensibilities tend to go darker. Um, so who knows, right? Look for that for me. <laughs> and, and short stories and literary stuff and things like that. Um, but I'm definitely out of the tie-in fiction biz for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to live, like you had said, it's like writing uh, historical fiction. I've told people that over and over again. It really is. You have to really be willing to do the homework. And I don't think I could live in another world like that to the degree you have to, I think, to do it well. So let me ask you about something I, that I saw on uh, the Twitter sphere, right? I, I follow mm -hmm. you on Twitter. Um, and, and I think you you have recently posted that you, you got another short story accepted. Um, uh -huh. And you referred to something as the year of Phil. Could you, oh, could it's, you tell me? It. 2021 oh. is the year of Phil. Um, this, this was, so like, I think like everyone in the world, 
old. Um, who has ever heard of New Year's resolutions, I would occasionally make those. And I could get, I think I've gotten to like mid-March on a couple of them at some point in my, you know, 56 years of, of life. Um, and, you know, in, two, in 2000, at the, this time, or really in, in December of 2019, I was like, yeah, you know, 2020, I'm going to do all this stuff, right? I got to kind of shake some stuff up. I had been teaching online courses and, and doing tutorials for Writer's Digest. They went through this bankruptcy and were taken up by another company and things kind of fell apart there. Um, and I thought, you know, I can do these myself. I'll find a good platform and get those all started. Um, I've got this, another writing book that's basically in the can and ready to go. I'll just publish that myself. And then all of a sudden, they, that just didn't happen in 2020, happened instead. So yeah. <laughs> the year of Phil in 2020 was taken over by the year of a ton of other stuff. Um, and so I just thought this year, look, there's really nothing stopping me from doing this stuff anyway. I work from home. I'm I'm already quarantined. I've been quarantined since June of 2010. I'm not going <laughs> So, you know, this is what the year of Phil now is, is you're going to see stuff from me, like, um, you know, writing tutorials, writing courses, online courses, and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, really ramping back up. Some self-published books, other, right, more short stories and things like that out there in the world. And, um, I might finish a novel by the end of this year, too. We'll see. But there's going to be a lot going on, for sure. That's really exciting. And uh, and we will keep our eyes open for that stuff. And, and they can follow you on Twitter. Twitter. What is your Twitter handle that they can follow? It's easy. It's just at Phil Athens, P H I L A T H A N S. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for meeting with us tonight and, and chatting with us and sort of giving us perspective into our beloved Sembia. Well, great. And thanks for having me. It was just, it was, this was a, a really positive and good, um, you know, series for me. I think, you know, there was a little bit of drama here and there, but it, I really like the way it came out and, and what came out of it. So it was nice to sort of get back into that headspace and even flip through this story Bible again for the first time in 20 years. The next 40 episodes we will be sort of, I guess you could say, preaching your gospel. <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks. Though this marks the end of the episode, the tale continues within a 10 day. Join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose.